Chapter 16 You mentioned casually in your last letter that the patient has continued to attend one church, and only one, since he was converted, and that he is not wholly pleased with it. May I ask what you are about? Why have I no report on the cause of his fidelity to the parish church? Do you realize that unless it is due to indifference, it is a very bad thing? Surely you know that if a man can't be cured of church-going, the next best thing is to send him all over the neighborhood looking for the church that suits him until he becomes a taster or connoisseur of churches. The reasons are obvious. In the first place, the parochial organization should always be attacked, because being a unity of place and not of likings, it brings people of different classes and psychology together in the kind of unity the enemy desires. The congregational principle, on the other hand, makes each church into a kind of a club, and finally, if all goes well, into a coterie or faction. In the second place, the search for a suitable church makes a man a critic, where the enemy wants him to be a pupil. What he wants of the layman in church is an attitude which may indeed be critical in the sense of rejecting what is false and unhelpful, but which is wholly uncritical in the sense that it does not a prize. It does not waste time in thinking about what it rejects, but lays itself open in uncommenting, humble receptivity to any nourishment that is going. You see how groveling, how unspiritual, how unredeemably vulgar he is. This attitude, especially during the sermons, creates the condition most hostile to our whole policy, in which platitudes can become really audible to the human soul. There is hardly any sermon or any book which may not be dangerous to us if it is received in this temper. So, pray, bestir yourself, and send this fool round the neighboring churches as soon as possible. Your record up to date has not given us much satisfaction. The two churches nearest to him I have looked up in the office. Both have certain claims. At the first of these, the vicar is a man who has been so long engaged in watering down the faith to make it easier for supposedly incredulous and hard-headed congregation that it is now he who shocks his parishioners with his unbelief, not vice versa. He has undermined many a soul's Christianity. His conduct of the services is also admirable. In order to spare the laity all the difficulties, he has deserted both the lectionary and the appointed psalms, and now, without noticing it, revolves endlessly round a little treadmill of his fifteen favorite psalms and twenty favorite lessons. We are thus safe from the danger that any truth not already familiar to him and to his flock should reach them through Scripture. Uh, but perhaps your patient is not quite silly enough for this church. Uh, or not yet? Uh, at the other church we have Friar Spike. The humans are often puzzled to understand the range of his opinions. Why is he one day almost a communist, and the next not far from some kind of theocratic fascism? One day a scholastic, and the next day prepared to deny human reason altogether. One day immersed in politics, and, the day after, declaring that all states of this world are equally under judgment. We, of course, see the connection link, which is hatred. The man cannot bring himself to teach anything which is not calculated to mock, grieve, puzzle, or humiliate his parents and their friends. A sermon which such people, 
would accept would be to him as insipid as a poem which they could scan. There is a promising streak of dishonesty in him. We are teaching him to say, the teaching of the church is, when he really means, I'm almost certain I recently read in Maritain something of that sort. But I must warn you that he has one fatal defect. He really believes. And this may yet mar all. But there is one good point which both these churches have in common. They are both party churches. I think I warned you before that if your patient can't be kept out of church, he ought at least to be violently attached to some party within it. I don't mean on really doctrinal issues, uh, about those the more lukewarm he is the better. And it isn't the doctrines on which we chiefly depend for producing malice. The real fun is working up hatred between those who say mass and those who say holy communion, when neither party could possibly state the difference between, say, um, Hooker's doctrine and Thomas Aquinas's in any form that would hold water for five minutes. And all the purely indifferent things, candles and clothes and what not, are all admirable grounds for our activities. We have quite removed from men's minds what that pestilent fellow Paul used to teach about food and other unessentials, namely, that the human, without scruples, should always give in to the human with scruples. You would think they could not fail to see the application. You would expect to find the low churchman genuflecting and crossing himself, lest the weak conscience of his high brother should be moved to irreverence, and the high one refraining from these exercises, lest he should betray his low brother into idolatry. And so it would have been, but for our ceaseless labor. Without that, the variety of usage within the Church of England might have become a positive hotbed of charity and humility. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.